Okay. So now we come to the Eightfold Path, and uh, which is the therapy. And guess what? The first branch of the Eightfold Path is not meditation. <laughs> Although, don't get me wrong, because I'm talking to a bunch of meditators and saying it's not the panacea, because it is really important. It's the last branch, samadhi, you know, concentration. It is. And maybe it's an aspect of the, of the seventh and eighth branches. But the first branch is what's called right, in your books you're going to read right worldview. I don't like right, right and wrong for those two, samyak and mitya. True and false, is, it, it's not wrong to say right and wrong, or true and false, but right and wrong is immediately understood by people as right and wrong according to some rule. You know, like you're, you've, you follow the rules, so you're right and right chess. But I prefer it, it's not a rule, it's according to reality. So I, and I got this from Alan Wallace. That's the first place I saw this, and it doesn't quite click, I must admit, from my, my former student and good friend. Um, realistic is much better. Realistic and unrealistic is better than true and false because of its connotations for us. So realistic worldview is the first branch. And that is actually the wisdom branch. So wisdom comes first, right away in the path. And wisdom is not just mysticism or something like the, you know, like having an empty mind or something like that. Not at all. Wisdom is, is the word used for wisdom is the same word used for intelligence, but intensified. So super intelligence is what it's what it means. Pradnya. Nya is is kno, same root, Indo-European linguistic root for knowing, knowing. Right? We have a K-N, right? No, we don't pronounce the K, because it's hard to pronounce. In, in Sanskrit, which is a sort of primal in the European language, it's Gnya, Jnya, it's a J, it's even hard to pronounce, Jnya. So Pra and Pra means super, intense. And, and the way you super know something is, you first learn about it, you know, you learn what it's made of and how it works, and it's the whole thing about it. What, and you probe deeper and deeper, you drill down, try to find the full reality of something. And then you, you come up with different angles and perspectives on whatever you're examining. And then you sort of, you know, interlock them, you debate about them, you say, well, this is the only partial, and that's deeper. And so you critically investigate how you see the thing. And then finally, you may get to a point of, oh, it must be like this or that. And then you concentrate on that, and you come to a deep experience of it. And these are, and so you have what's called the wisdom born of learning, the wisdom born of critical reflection, which is a kind of meditation, like Descartes' meditations were critical reflection. They call it meditation de Descartes, critical reflection. And any kind of discursive meditation, in a way, is critical reflection. And then you come to one point in meditation, where through the critical reflection, you kind of come to a, to a brink of, it sort of must be that, but you know, maybe there's some doubt left, but you kind of understand, or at least you understand what it isn't, and now you have to focus on it. And then you, you, you combine a very high degree of concentration with that. So then that's wisdom born of what we could also call meditation or concentration you know, non-discursive meditation. So that's the first branch. And the key there is that he reports right away negation. That's why indeed even he expressed freedom. The word freedom, for example, we don't realize that because we live in America where people like W shout about freedom. Let's fight for freedom. Or they hate our freedom. And like he comes from Texas, so he has freedom. He thinks <laughs> freedom is a negation. You can't possess freedom. He's salt free. Where's the freedom? There's just no salt. <laughs> right? Sugar free, trouble free, depression free, anxiety free, addiction free. The freedom itself is just the lack of the addiction, anxiety, and the depression. The freedom is different. Free means need free, you know, absent, lacking. Self free would be a translation of selflessness. Free of self, a fixed self. So, so 
he, he expressed the prognosis in a negational way because the type of cognition that you have when you negate is different from the kind of cognition you have when you affirm, you know, positive cognition. And the delusion about your misascribing absolute status to things and yourself and selves is sort of confirmed every time you eyes, oh, there's a book, oh, there's Mark, oh, there's the cup. That, and the cup is a real thing, and my concept of cup fits right over that cup, and it goes to its essence. And my concept of Mark goes to its essence. My concept of myself goes to my essence. My first pronoun comes out of my essence. I, ego, ich, for dear Freud said ich. He didn't say ego, actually. He said ich. And, and uh, whereas when you don't find something, well, is there a book in this room? And you look everywhere, oh, okay. At some point you just stop looking. Is there an elephant in this room? Uh, okay, you stop looking. You don't ever find the elephant lessness of the room. You're just free of the worry about being trampled by the elephant. So he defined the prognosis as a freedom. Nirvana means freedom. But that's a negation. And, every, and we, negation is a very important thing in our practical lives, right? We won't, we won't eat it unless it's MSG free. We won't go to that Chinese restaurant. You know, we, if we're a vegetarian, we won't eat unless it's meat free. If we, even if we're, if we're an organic kind of a, you know, meat eater, we won't eat it unless it's hormone free. Organic grass fed, whatever, 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 whatever. Right? So, so it's not that, even though you don't really close around the negation, it's still a powerful thing. Very, very powerful, right? It involves how we negotiate interrelating with things, right? So by saying niroda, niroda means cessation, nirvana means extinction, blowing out. And finally, modern, we're so lucky to live in a modern world where we have hip language. Because finally, we, in our popular language, we have nirvana right there. When you have gone to the great concert, and people say, how was it? And you really had a great time, what do you say? I was blown away. <laughs> and that nirvana means being blown away, blown out. You know? The little flame of my anxiety, depression, and addiction was temporarily blown away even by aesthetic experience. So, but as the prognosis is, you can be blown away, which we're not afraid of, right? It's like that. If somebody said some deep negation, we would be really freaked out. <laughs> <laughs>